Welcome to the Sportlink podcast. I'm Mark Armstrong and we've got a cracking interview for you this week with one of the finest runners to have come out of Ireland in John Downs. John was one of the best runners of his generation, winning the British Cross Country Championships in 1996, running 13.29 for 5k and generally being one of the most kick-ass athletes around in more ways than one. We talked to John about his illustrious career, the ups and the downs, whilst also getting his views on what's happening at governance level of British athletics at the moment, something which he feels is especially passionate about. Of course, Neil is here to deliver his training tip of the week, and in Featherby's funnies, Neil details when he almost became the first ever athlete to go under 60 minutes for a half marathon, and also took home the ladies' trophy. So, Neil, how are you? Okay this week? Yep, absolutely wonderful, mate. Yep. Yeah, long, if the dogs are okay, mate, then I'm okay. You know the well, I've known you long enough now. If the dogs are all right, then you're all right. Yeah, well, Luna, Luna's had a bit of a strain this week. She, we were out running um, last weekend, and we hit a nice patch, and she went sideways a little bit, so she had a bit of a strain. But seriously, mate, she, she hasn't been able to run all week. Um, and it's amazing. It's, it's, just, it's just like I'm about to write about it in the column. Um, anyone who might have read the column today, they'll say I've mentioned it. Um, just like, just like us, mate, when they can't run, mate, boy, is she moody. She <laughs> really is moody. I mean, she's going out for walks, obviously. You've got to have that mental stimulation. But um, she is seriously moody, mate, because she can't run. So, hey, like me, like the dogs, mate, we have to run. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And and someone who also has to, has to run this week is, is our guest, uh, uh, John Downs. Oh, he, he's, I mean, what, what a guest <laughs> to have on this week for us. Mate, it's, it's awesome. I mean, I'm in awe of the guy. Um, you know, it's like, I'm just going to sit in and I'm going to listen, mate, because, you know, uh, I followed his career. I mean, his, his career was sort of come towards the end of mine, so we never sort of met back then. But, I mean, obviously, I, everyone knows John Downs. I used to follow him. Just such a hard man. As far as I'm concerned, mate, he was as near as it got to the real half top, you know, the top of the track. Um, tough, tough, hard man, mate. But um, so bloody honest as well, you know, you know, he's so passionate about his sport, you know, and whether you fully agree with everything he says or not, and I have to say I do agree with most of the stuff, um, and I think a lot of other people do too, it's just that sometimes people aren't always prepared to put their hands up and say, yeah, I'm with you on that, because he can be outspoken, we know that, uh, and I'm not saying everything he says is right, of course, but at the same time, he 100% believes passionately uh, in what he says, and the most important thing is, there's no hidden agendas. Everything he's got a real true love for the sport, and he only wants the best for the sport and for the people within the sport too. I like mean, being the athletes, of course, and coaches. I mean, I, I think I think uh, you, you've obviously watched a lot of his his vlogs and uh, and stuff. I mean, his argument is that is that there, there should be other sort of priorities for uh, for, for the UK at the moment. It's near that than sort of like the run equal and, and fighting battles that aren't really there at the moment. And obviously, the equality and diversity. A statement that came out recently yeah yeah you know look we all have to be very careful and mindful about what we're what we're saying and about what we're perhaps going to say next you know and in, in, in some respects i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing to be honest with you because you know we do all have thoughts and and freedom of speech only goes so far doesn't it um and, and no one wants to hurt anyone anyone or say anything wrong no, you know god almighty you know life's far too short and i think most of us have realized that in the last 12 months but the sport is the sport and we all know running has changed it has changed dramatically you know in, well in the last year for sure but you know even going back to you know there's more people than ever that run now and you know i don't care what anyone say i'm absolutely made up about that i think it's awesome that everyone can go for a run don't matter how old you are what you look like what your standard is if you want to put a pair of running shoes on and go and run in color you know the most bright colorful clothes in the world where you stand at a mile so bloody what you know just do it and, and, and people do accept that now um but and uh, athletics as a sport is very very competitive and, and and i think it's fair to say now that it's probably at the minority side of running so to speak and uh, i'm probably getting criticized for saying that but it is you know i think there's more people that run for their own needs for their own pleasure for their own fun to get that medal to show their medal off and their proud achievements on social media whatever um with no idea or no, no thoughts of ever, should we say, taking part in a track race, you know, which we found out last year when we put those track series on in August, and lots of people had never been on the track before and they loved it. But, you know, 
that's all about them going up around them because there's now lots more races races around there's lots of event companies that's got involved whereas maybe a few years ago it was mainly the clubs that put on the races um so to speak and there's all sorts of diverse races i mean getting chased by zombies paintball race whatever and people love that so what it's not athletics is it it's not competitive athletics and and i think it's almost to the point where you almost need dare i say not two governing bodies but maybe a governing body that's split in half you know one that's there to ensure that we keep grassroots athletics going you know the club systems going you know the kids coming through the sport supporting the athletes supporting the athletes the coaches and the administrators who need that support whilst also being very mindful and looking after those other people the club runners that maybe do the local road race enjoy turning up for the club but want to do other things as well um but you know that's just my opinion anyway and, and, and john's got a lot more stronger feelings than i have on that sort of thing i'm sure John Downs, welcome to the Sportling Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you today? I'm fine, Mark. Thanks for having me. And thanks for having me, Neil. It's an absolute pleasure, mate. No, thank you. All the thank yous are going your way, mate. We're absolutely made up to have you on here. That's it. We're, we're just just talking. It. How's lockdown been for you, John, so far? Um, where, where I live, small kind of rural countryside, small village and stuff like that. So in a way, a lot of uh, being away from people and isolated anyway. But it's 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 dragging on a bit now, to be quite honest. Um, you know, you can't go to the cinema, swimming pool, certain shops are closed. Uh, it, it can graze in you a little bit. Um, I think being an athlete has kind of helped out with the mental side of things because you're able to kind of live in your own head. So from that point of view, I'm not too bad, but I wouldn't like to be stuck in London somewhere on the 50th floor in a flat and not being able to go out and do anything. That would be just my idea of hell, to be honest. So I'm good. I'm all right, really. Can you just explain to our viewers what where, whereabouts in Ireland that, that you actually are at the moment? Oh, that could be dangerous because I could have a, a, a drone target the house and there could be oh, a few yeah. bombs dropped. Um, I live, I live, I live in a small, small, uh, near a small little village uh, called Art Patrick, and it's which is about a mile and a mile and a half away, and the same which is a, a town called Kilfinane, about a mile and a half away, and so it's in County Limerick. Um, it's beautiful. It's ideal. It's uh, it's fantastic. The the only drawback about being in Ireland for me is is being away from what I call real athletics. And I suppose the real athletics I bought into was what was I was indoctrinated into in England. I mean, I know I started juvenile level here on that, but the English system for me is is well, it's the best to be honest with you. And it, it just it, it it afforded so much diversity. It was it was fantastic, you know. Is that where you grew up, where you live at the moment? Is that how, I can say, is that how you got into running? Yeah, I, I left here when I was 20 years of age um, uh, and went to England. Um, I came over in 1988, early 1988. Um, unemployment, nothing was happening here, to be quite honest with you. Um, the best export we've ever done is, our, is, is the people of Ireland, really. We've just gone all over the world. So I went over in 1988. I had kind of hoped to do running in some way. Um, I was going to try and join Hercules Wimbledon. I was kind of inspired a little bit by reading about Dave Clark and Athletics Weekly and so on. Uh, but when I got over, it, it quickly transpired that I thought I was not going to be able to do this running because I had to get used to to the work, the hours, tubes, trains, buses, streets. I'd never made a phone call till I'd actually gone to England. I'd never used a phone in my life. Um, so it was a... It was a massive culture shock, to be quite honest with you. I mean, when they say we're green, I was green. I hadn't a clue. <laughs> Thinking back, I hadn't a clue. But as fair would have it, as fair would have it, I was out in a run one evening and um, I, I had to stop for a pee and I went into this local church in Ealing. And as I came out, there was a sign up for London Irish Athletic Club. And I just thought, ah, put that to the back of your head. That's not going to happen. It's, it's going to be work from here on in. I uh, got back to my digs. Everything I had was gone. Money, tools, clothes, everything. I was standing in what I was I was after going for a run. And the only thing I could think about was that sign. I went back down, broke the glass, got the piece of paper out, bumped 20 pence off two people, rang the first person on the sheet. It was PJ Fagan, God rest him of London Irish. And the rest, that's it. I took off and I ended up doing a lot of running in England. And probably the best years of my life, to be quite honest. Fantastic, fantastic. So, so had, had you sh shown much sort of capacity for running, obviously, when you were in Ireland to begin with? How, how did that sort of transpire that you came over to England first? Um, I, 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 how I got into running in Ireland, um, 
was I, I was I was after doing an open sports and I was after running this mile. I was only I was only thirteen and I was after running this mile race and it was the under twenty race. And I was leading till about five meters in the line and this nineteen year old guy just dipped me in the line and won the race. But there happened to be a guy there from a, 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 a club called Croom Athletic Club. It's kind of close to Limerick City. And he was involved, obviously, with them. And he asked me to join. And I suppose I went, I didn't do any training, but we were naturally fit because uh, everywhere you go here, you have to walk or run to school or cycle to school. There was no lifts or anything like that. So um, I did that and I went to the first race. It was the County Limerick Cross Country Championships. And I won it. And then I went to the South of Ireland Cross Country Championships, ran it, and I won it. I then went to an open race, and I won that, beating the, um, the Leinster champion. That would be the Eastern. So we, we break our regions into North, South, East, and West. So he was the Eastern champion. I beat him. And then I went to my first All-Ireland, which I wasn't used to the mud, to be quite honest, and I was running barefoot, and I finished ninth. And after that, I was kind of hooked, and I didn't look back. Um... My dad never said to me he ran. He was a runner himself. Uh, but when I was about eight, five years later, about 18, he brought out all the trophies and medals. And um, he showed me everything he'd done. And I was, that's kind of sealed it more that it was kind of meant to be, if that makes sense. Never coached here. I was coached by nobody. I just go out and run. I knew nothing about any workouts or sessions. It was just, if I felt good, I ran fast. If I didn't, I just took it easy. And I was winning all sorts of titles in between 800, 1500 mostly at um, national level. Um, and that's, that's, how I, that's how I became involved in it, to be honest. It was kind of just through running an open sport. And there was a guy there from, from Crew Delhi Club and he asked me to run and I did. And, it, and I've been involved. That was what, that's 40 years ago now. God, I that's 40 years ago. <laughs> just, <laughs> I, just, I just said it. Yeah. So, so when you when you came over to, to, to England, John, that, that wasn't for athletics. That was to, to, to find work, basically. Was it to it wasn't it was nothing to do with it? I I have I have a kind of a well, there's a confession there because I'd be a bit fiery and, and stuff like that. And I was getting an awful lot of abuse from officials here, uh, in terms of <clears throat> I'd be very outspoken. I've always been very outspoken. Um, and I've always kind of defended my own position. I'm never gonna look for trouble, never try to instigate. I'd rather get on with people, but if I felt something was wrong, I'd speak out about it. It's just the way I am. It's just the way I'm built. And I wouldn't just do it for myself. I'd be doing it for others. And uh, I got, I kind of got a, a bit of abuse at about three or four races. And uh, in 1988, there was the national, we've kind of races broken up here from novice, intermediate and senior. And if you happen to do well at senior level, you can't run novice or you can't run intermediate. You're ruled out. It's kind of, an incentive for people to keep going and try and win a national title and you don't know what's going to come out of it rather than being lost to the sport. So when they come out of juvenile <clears> and <throat> rather straight into the deep end, they had a system here to try and encourage and try and retain. So I was I was actually eligible to run this national intermediate because they had to change the rules that year because it would normally be the second last race of the season. Um but it was the last race because the trial was there earlier to make the World Cross Country team for New Zealand. And when I got there, uh, they told me I couldn't run. They didn't know their own rules. I ran in protest. An official uh, punched me in, in the back of the head twice and three times, knocked me to the ground. I got up. I broke his jaw and I carried on, caught up to the guy on the race. And then I got a two-year ban. So it was kind of twofold why I, I, I went to England. <laughs> Because I remember going to the meet and I said, you're banned. And I said, that's all right. It's no problem with that. That's fine. You, you, you can you can give me the ban, but I won't be here. I'm going to England next week. So good luck with that. And so and I went to England. And I had every intention of running initially at the start, but it didn't work out that way because of the, I was trying to get used to everything. It was Christ, it was tough actually looking back at it because I was just very naive. Um, you're putting a lot of trust in people. You could be taking advantage quite a lot. And, uh, but I was, I was, what I thought was the worst thing was having all my tools and everything taken and, and, and my money and my clothes actually was a blessing in disguise. So because when I rang PJ, what a great man. God, he was fantastic. And he took me in, gave me a load of money, got me a job with him. And I did start running for London Irish. And I suppose within, I came home for Christmas. I hadn't seen my mum for about, a, about nearly 
a year now at this stage. And, um, well, it was about 11 months. And I came back after three weeks of no work and I ran to Southern and I finished fifth. And that's when I thought, I, I am not bad at this. I'm not bad at this. And uh, I kind of, my, 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 my sights were set in different stuff. Like, you know, I mean, if you look at my career in England, I've won just about everything just to win bad the national. You know, won North London's, London's, you know, North of the Thames, Middlesex, South of England, fastest leg of England, tw- six, uh, what you call it, uh, national cross country relays, won the 12 stages, won the British inter counties, and third in the English. So I've, it's the only one that's missing it. It still grades me a little bit. I'd nearly love to go back and try and have a, a pop at it somewhere. But I, I didn't do too bad, to be honest. And, and a lot of it off work and ridiculous hours, to be quite honest. You, Neil, I think you, you said, uh, alluded to me earlier that you worked on a um, building site yourself. So yeah. it's, it's not an easy tough. trade to try and run really with, is tough. it? Yeah, really tough. That was when I was getting back into running, John. I mean, I'd had a four or five year layoff. I, I packed in at 16. And then started running again when I was 20, 21. And that's when I was working in the building trade. But I didn't really start training seriously, mate, until I came out of the building trade. You know, every day would be, you know, I'd have an intended run every single day of the week. But sometimes back then, I'm going back, what, 1978, 79. It didn't always happen, mate. You know, when you're bloody unloaded like 10 ton of bloody cement off lorries and been digging digging bloody holes in the ground Mm. with pickaxes back then and then shoveling bloody... Mark him hauling bricks around, you'd be bloody nag. I mean, that was that was a gym in itself, wasn't it? But it was good, mate. It was good. Yeah, tough people love it. I enjoyed it, mate. I did actually enjoy the building trade, if I'm honest with you. But it's not really conducive to being a, a really good athlete, apart from half Tupper, mate. And you're yeah, a better no. half Tupper I've ever seen. No, when you when you when you when you get to a certain level, it's it's then it's yeah. different. It really is different. You you just Rest and recovery is just so paramount. It was it was no fluke when I took ninety four out of a, a year out of the building site. Now I did some part time work in America and that, but I was able to rest more. It was it was no fluke. I jumped to a completely different level, massive level. So, um, but yeah, I enjoyed it myself. But there was days, Neil, as you know, you'd be inside in the house around December, no windows and doors, and, and the wind coming through, and it, and it was absolutely skinny, skinny. Yeah. You know, yeah, we used yeah. to go and build a fire, mate, and go and fill up the buckets with the red diesel. It was like a bloody atomic bomb going up in yeah. the air. I, 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 used, I used to run in, take off my sweaty gear, and if, there was a, if the digger was on site, you'd put a, a, a board on the, on the engine and you'd put the clothes on it to try and get it dry so you could run home in the evening. That's right. Stuff you used to think of <laughs> on our feet. So you could run into work, change, leave clothes inside from the evening before, you're putting them on, freezing cold, Oh, and I know you'd be thinking in your head is get through today and try and do the run home in the evening. So you might you might run nine miles in and it could be eight miles home or whatever, you know. Oh, nuts, nuts when you think about it. The, the, the last building site I worked on, mate, it was two years behind deadline day. So that tells you everything. Oh. <laughs> it was uh, oh it. You know, I worked roofs. We did roofing as well, mate. We did a lot. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Standing on a bloody yeah. roof in, in January, February, March, as you said, with the wind howling. Oh my god. But like I said, mate, it's not conducive, you know, and the guys, I mean, without a doubt, I mean, you only got to look back at the guys in the in the 60s and 70s, they were all tough, but I don't think there's too many came out of the building trade, do you? I'm so, oh, Jimmy Alder. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Alder. Jimmy Alder. Jimmy Jimmy Alder. What a man he was. Yeah. And the only other person I could think around my time, and he was a hard, he was a hard bastard, was Dale Lockley from Chelmsford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dale yeah. was tough. Yeah. Near so he was when I walked with Dale and I ran with Dale and I raced against Dale and everything was like hammer and tongs. Yeah. When he when he went walking, man, bricky in and that, you knew you were tending him. Trust me and that. Because he could he was he was a hard he was hard. And yeah, he, he, I love what I loved about him was he never whinged, moaned, he just got on, uh, with, got on with it. You know. Got oh on. he and he and he did. Mm. But in, ter- in terms of those at the very top and the international athletes, I mean, I know loads of guys who work on building sites this day that are very, very good club runners. But like I said, when it comes to international, it's not conducive, is it? And let's be fair about it, mate. <clears throat> no, it's, it's, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's going it? to be very hard to get up to that level. I mean, I, I mean, I did well, but I'll be honest with you, there, there are so many nationals I regret where I came in and I just wasn't, I wasn't, I couldn't get fresh. It was impossible to get fresh. You run about, you know, the seven and a half stone bags of cement. I remember having to lift five hundred of them up five flights of stairs in a hotel in Harrow a day before a race. Yeah. Five hundred of them. 
yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and then people said, do you go to the gym? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. As you said, it was a gym. It was a gym, mate. The competitions we used to have on, they were, were pretty mega, mind you. What was but, the mileage um, like, John, that you used to do when, when, when you were building? Well, when I, when I was in Ireland, funny enough, and I, I never had any coaching and that stuff. Like that. I suppose it was just very natural. I mean, I started off that I was fit anyway, because if you wanted to get somewhere quick, you ran. So if you wanted to get home from school, which was three miles in and three miles home, so six miles a day, whether you're walking or running, you're doing it, right? Um, I never really counted it too much. I'd, I'd say I was doing about 35, 40 miles a week, up until I was about 17. And then I started gradually probably adding a little bit further. And there was nobody telling me this. It just it was just coming naturally. I, I never chased running. I didn't know what pace I was running at. All I knew is that if I was running well in a race, that's all that mattered. I, I didn't go by anything else. And I didn't have anybody probably being toxic wrong me or telling me I should do this or I should do that. Um, the only time that happened was when I was about 18 and a half, 19. Somebody told me, you need to start doing a long run on a Sunday. If you don't do anything else, just get in a long run. And I, I, I obviously started getting up from, which was long for me, it was about six or seven miles. I started getting up to about 14, 15. And I started doing quite well after that, taking on a lot of seniors and so on. When I went to England, I probably initially started off at 60, 70. It was all gradually, progressed just naturally without trying to force it. But probably by my best years and stuff like that, I was probably doing 150, 160 miles a week. You know, that was, but I never did workouts too much with it, to be honest, Mark. I, I always just did running. And then I might go back, I might do that for 10 weeks of 150, 160 miles a week, right? And I go by feel. And, it, and, and feel you now, could someday I feel like I was crawling and I could be running 6.45, seven minute pace. Another day I could feel like I was flying it and I could only be running 7.40, eight minute pace. But it didn't bother me. It was just getting it in the, in the bank. And, you know, it, 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 it worked for me. And then when I'd come off that, I might go down to four weeks of 75, 80 mile a week and I'd start throwing in some workouts and then I'd take off. So I, 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 didn't, I didn't get too confused with too much stuff. I kept it very simple. Running's the name of the game. I did a lot of running. And I knew that if I turned up to a race, I was pretty hard when I raced. I, I, I could get into myself. I could make myself suffer, to be honest. I mean, I really could go to the that that house of pain, really. Um, and it never bothered me. And I never worried about who was there because there was always going to be somebody there and there was always going to be somebody different coming from behind. And I'd seen them coming, I'd seen them go, and I was going to still be around and see them come and see them go. I was in it for the long haul. So, And if I did well, it was great. And if I didn't, I had to go back and reassess. I didn't overcomplicate it too much, to be honest. Did you enjoy the, like, Was it all about the racing for you? Did you have that in mind when you were training? Was it always about that? The, the only, there's only one finishing line there. There was the only one thing that interested me, and that was the race. Everything else, I mean, I did it. I put it in. There was days I didn't want to go out and do it and stuff like that. The, the best thing, the best way I got in a lot of my training was, was I ran to work. And it could be five miles away. It could be 40 miles away. Didn't matter. Get up at half five, and I got it in. And I used to love some days where I the run in and I was working all day knowing I mightn't have to run that evening. And that was I used to call that my lovely day. But there was other days then I would, I would, I'd probably run, I might get a tube and I might get off and I might run three or four miles home just to loosen out. Um, so I, I, I just, I kind of just did it and, and I didn't worry too much about it in terms of um, what I was actually doing. Yes, I did some, some great workouts and structured workouts, but they're, they're no good doing these amazing workouts if you're not racing well. And for me, if I was, what I was doing was working and I was up with the likes of Dave Lewis or Eamon Martin or Jean-Louis Prienan in France and stuff like that, I thought, I can't be doing too badly here. My biggest problem was recovery. I just wasn't. I was grand Monday, Tuesday, maybe half day Wednesday, but come Thursday, Friday, because of the work, I'd, I'd start to notice myself dip. And I noticed I nearly had to have every 18th day off. It was kind of like this 18th day, and I, and I would take it off. It would, wouldn't bother me, you know. And and there was no days of the week with me either. You know the way most people plan out the week, and they've got you know Sundays a long run, Mondays it. I just I just didn't go by that. I mean I I get in a long run on a Sunday, but 
if it shifted and it was a Monday, it was a Monday. If it was a Tuesday, it was a Tuesday. It, it didn't really bother me that much because I, I just, I, I refused to get caught up in days of the week or we have to do a session Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Well, what happens if you miss Tuesday? People panic and they get all clogged in their head. And then they've only a day recovery and they're doing Thursday. I, if I did only one session a week or didn't do a session that week, it didn't bother me. It was how I was performing is what interested me. And if I was winning and taking people on, there was no need to change. Spot on. PT people are stuck to rigid routines, aren't they? Sunday is Sunday, Monday is Monday, Tuesday is at the track, Wednesday is another long run, Thursday is more so at the track again. And that's the, I always said, what would we do if there was nine days in a week? Would we do a long run every ninth day? Do you know what I mean? It's just, I'm with you on that one, John. You know. Yeah, you yeah. Know. I mean, I had somebody say to me one time, you know, when I was coaching him, he said, oh, I'm tired. And I said, right, but let's go through it. Well, I only did this Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. And I said, you got to stop right there. I said, your body doesn't recognize days of the week. It just recognizes it's tired. So I said, what are you doing? So you, you just need to just, so many people get caught up. It's a very, very simple sport, really. It's one foot in front of the other. It's trying to make incremental gains all the time. Everybody tries to throw everything at everybody, you know, gym sessions, core circuits, stuff like that. You, you just got to take your time and say, well, what do I need to work on first? And then kind of get that right. And then you start adding slowly. It's like building a house. You know, you can't have the roof on if you've no foundation in it. The foundation, that's right. Without the foundation, the rest fall down. Or it's weak. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I always believed in getting that foundation right. I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong. I'd come back off. Nearly after a cross-country season, I would nearly have 10 days, two weeks off. Nobody did that. But I did it. Because I was tired. I was mentally tired. I was physically tired all the time. And... I needed that to boost myself back up. So I'd run to 12 stages in April and I'd be like a bag of shite. I wouldn't be what a hen's piss because I'd just be, I'd be unfit. I'd have put on weight. I'd have gone away and enjoyed myself and I'd have de-stressed. I'd have ran for my club and my team and I'd have turned out no problem. But I'd be got goals, which were going to be probably the three A's or a fast 5,000 or whatever I was going to try and do as best I could in the summer. Because for me, the summer hours were ridiculous. The hours we walked were longer because of the light. Right. So we were able to do more. But if you're doing more, you're not able to run. You're not able to recover. So my track times never really reflected my cross-country performances because I just was working such long hours, to be quite honest. Yeah. Was it the cross country, John, that, that you, you really enjoyed more so than, than, than the track stuff? Yeah, I mean, it was it was more natural for me. I loved kind of coming in low and coming around corners and kind of chicaning it, as they call it. Because you, you, a lot of guys that run cross country, they might be good runners, but they don't have that flexibility of drop down. I mean, I could hug a bin like you wouldn't believe. And, and, and I'd, I'd have 10, 15 yards on a guy without even trying. I loved the broken rhythm of it. I loved the tough hills in it. I mean, I loved hills. I, when I got to a course, I remember the first time I ran the National and I ran in Round Tape Park and we, we, didn't, we didn't walk all of it. I just had a, a look of where it started. You went down a hill, you came up hill 60, which is 60 degrees. And I was looking at this and I would, could see all the rolling hills out the back. And I thought, I'm going to have a good one today. This is going to suit me. Now, I'm known as a mudlark, but I would prefer a really tough, runnable course like Round Tape Park. It doesn't cut up, but it's very hill, ver very hilly, very tough. I'd love that all day long because I would just drive people into the ground. It's my biggest asset. Kenny Stewart years ago when I ran in Corby and Kenny was like 2.11 for the marathon and he was world fell running champion. He was one of the greatest fell runners ever. I passed Kenny going up a hill and he, he pulled me out and said, who, who, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> and I said my name. He said, where are you from? And he said, I, I said, I'm from Ireland. And he, he said, nobody beats me going up a hill. Nobody. And I said, they did today. I'm sorry. And he looked at me and I, I just love hills. I just run up and down them all day long. It's not a problem, you know? You know what and, the ticket uh, was, didn't you? That 500 uh, bags of cement, mate. He couldn't, he couldn't run up and down with 500 bags of cement, mate. That was the secret. Well, <laughs> do you know what? It's funny you mentioned that because when, when I was getting to the last 100 bags of that, I remember doing it up in Gaten Road in Harrow. And, and I, remember, I remember saying, I want to get home early because this is a job I finished. Now, 500 bags... Came in at eight o'clock in the morning. You normally finish at five. And you're looking, if I can get home an hour earlier, I have an hour extra rest. I have the London Cross Country Championships tomorrow. I'm going to get this finished. So but you end up expending really? energy because yeah. you, you want to try and get home early. So, and I ran home. I didn't get a tube or a bus home. I ran home because when I was living in Rainers Lane from where we were walking, it was probably about five miles. 
So that was an easy day. And I, and I was like, oh, I've had an easy day today. <laughs> when I look back at it, in your mind, it, was yeah, fucking, it was hard. Yeah. It yeah. was so hard. It was so bloody hard when you think. When I look back at it, I go, you know, I, I, I did exceptionally well, but there's a lot of regret because of, of the job, the nature of the job. It's, it's, <clears> but it, it, look, it's, it's only fun. I can't I can't cost it too much because if I hadn't come over to do that sort of a job, I would have never ended up where I ended up. So I, I can't turn around and be angry with what set me on the past, if you know what I mean. It is what it is, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah I mean, like, I, I'm sure you do this, and I think all athletes are footballers or whatever. There's, there is days you sit down and you kind of go, this. I don't have many regrets. I've, I've about three. I have three regrets. And one of them is that I never won the English National. And I'm, I, I think the one I should have won, I was closer in other races, but the one I should have won was, I think, 93 and Parliament Hill. But I ran the most stupid race that I've ever ran in my life. And I wasn't the guy that ran stupid. I, I normally use my my, 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 count, my brain and that. And um, I, I made I made a most monumental muck-up of a mistake uh, on the first lap, which I never did. I, I tried to get away. I tried to get away from the likes of Nuraka and Billy D and Paul Roden. And ah, halfway through the first lap, never show your hands. Never do that. Because you, you do that on that course, bite the ass off you. It's a tough course. And... Um, I, I suffered badly. Um, I mean, I was half hoping to get a medal, but not, not to be. Um, and I ran two weeks earlier in a place called Dikerch in Luxembourg. And it was one of these typical continental courses. Great hill in it, which suited me going up. But it was very severe down. And my hamstrings just, no. Nah, I'd gone to somebody twice. No, nah, never came around. So when I got myself in trouble, I was carrying timber around rather than carrying mm -hmm. hamstrings around. You know, I was just, I was just... <clears throat> It was like I was on the spot. How would you approach a race, John? Would you would you have a look around? That obviously you, you mentioned that you have a look at the course. Do you have a look at the competitors around you as well? Think what am I going to do today? No, no. I, I'll tell you why. And 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 Neil probably this if he's running the national and stuff like that. All, all the British inter counties, all the south of England, uh, cross country and stuff like that. When you go to these races, the fields, the amount of people running is so bloody big you don't know who's going to be there so i never went into a race with a plan because if you did you'd look up and you'd go oh he's here oh he's there your man's here oh he's here that's right there. Mm, ah, mm, mm. and all of a sudden once you get about a mile into the race you're looking around at about six people you didn't see before the race and i always said i'm not going to be surprised by who i see there and i know for a fact a lot of people run those races and they'd look up and they'd go, oh, Jesus, and it shocks them. And it's the worst thing. It's like a, it's like a punch into the solar plexus. So I never got upset about that. So I had, I, what I used to say to myself is, and I'm not making this up. I genuinely, it was my own, my own way of coming at things and my own way of, of working things out. I'd get there and I'd go, right, whoever's here today, I'm not going to be surprised. So then when I saw them, I would adapt in my head as to what needed to be done during the race. So, if it's nine miles, it's three by three mile laps. Well, it was pointless trying to make a plan early on. So, because I wanted, you'd get maybe three miles, four miles, you'd start to see who's at the business end of things. And you'd start to see who peels off, like an onion. And then you start going, right, he's got a bit of a kick. I can't be around with him at the finish because he can motor. Uh, that guy's weak in the hills. If I push it a little bit, don't dip in too much. I can pull away and get a gap. And I've still got not expended too much, and I've, I've hopefully got something in reserve for when I really do go. So you, you, it's it's like it's like mental chess while you're running, yeah. and you're trying to work out, you're trying to hear their breathing, and you're trying to see are uh, they looking around the base and how sweating, uh, how much they're sweating and stuff like that. It, it, I love that side of things, and I and funny enough, I used to love if I broke someone, like most athletes love when they break someone and they're away. And they think it's a way. And then if that person got back, they'd panic. Oh, geez, he's back. I didn't do the business. I'm in trouble now. I was, I was the complete opposite. I used to go, this guy's up for it. This is great. Let's see what he's got. <laughs> oh, come on. Bring it on. Like, I, I, was, I didn't really mean that. I used to love that side of things. And if he beat me, he beat me. But I, I loved that a guy like, was coming back from work. Like, geez, I'm after giving him my best shot there now. And he's back. I, I like to cut at this guy. I don't know who this guy is. But I like him because I didn't know who a lot of people were. Chat to him as well. Would you? Would you? Would you have a word with him? Or the only time I've ever done that is I remember going up to do a Chingford League, 
And this guy comes up to me, oh, you got this race one today, John. And I says, no, no, never say that. I says, you just don't know who's going to tr- turn up. Now, I wasn't at the standard I was before, but I, I, I needed a blowout. I needed to see where I was at. And um, this, this, this guy said, I oh, know, it's been nobody here. And I just went into it. Dave Lewis taught that at a Red Rose League in Burnley years ago, that he was going to have, go down and have an easy workout. And he ended up racing a guy called Steve Tunstall. And Tunstall kicks his ass by 20 seconds. And to this day, Dave, Dave Lewis is still scratching his head as to what, huh, huh, how did that? Um, so I got into the race and it, it goes off hard. I goes off hard. It's a mud bat, never ran there before. Uh, well marshaled, running around. This, this, it's five miles. I'm about a mile and a half, mile and a quarters in, and this guy is behind me and he's sitting there. And I go, geez, I'm not dropping this guy. This guy is not going anywhere. So we go up a steep hill. And I had my Kenny Stewart moment in this race, but I went up this steep hill and I put the boot down and he drew level on Simon. I thought, Jesus, I'm in serious trouble with this guy. This guy is fucking mortal. Like he is, he's giving it to me. Like he said nothing, but he was looking, he was looking sexy now, in fairness, right? So anyway, that was grand. Came back down the hill towards the finish and I turned around and said, who are you? And he just went into, hello, John, my name is Alan, and uh, I run with uh, Alder Shatton Farnham District. I, I'm really proud to be running against you today. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, right, no more the running commentary. I says, let's go at it. Like, and, but he, was, he, was, he wasn't in trouble, basically, because he was talking away to me like he was out for a Sunday morning jog. And I came round to that hill, and I, I said, I'm going to go as hard as I can. I don't care if I collapse coming off it. And he goes away from me, but I... He went, he went up the hill past me and he just, he took 50 hours out of me. And I was, I had my, I had my Kenny Stewart moment. It was, it was such a dose of humble pie. And he ended up beating me by 20 seconds. Uh, who was you it? Know, who was never, it again? Alan who? Um, I think his name was Jackson from Is... Aldershot. He was a 1500 meter runner. I think it's Alan. I think it's Alan. It's a long time ago now, so I might not have the first name right, but I think it's Jackson. And uh, he was coached by John Sullivan, I think, which was um, Dave Clark's yeah, coach yeah, yeah. back in the day. Yeah. So, yeah, but he, he absolutely annihilated me. I mean, I was gone past my best, but I wasn't at my best either for, for that particular stage. Yeah, yeah. But your man came up to me afterwards and goes, how much did you win by? And I said, I got beat. And he goes, yeah, right. No, I said, I got beat. Yeah, right. No, I said, I'm serious. I got absolutely hockeyed. I got beat. That guy over there beat me. He went away. He said, I should have never come near you. I said, I know, and I don't ever see you again. So that's, it's a bit of banter. It's, it, you know, I'm, I've, I have a nice memory of it, you know, because you learn as much in defeat as you do in victory, if not more. Absolutely. Tunstall's a name you remember, Steve Tunstall. Do you remember him? He, he actually did go on beating, didn't he, for about half a dozen races after he beat Dave Lewis. I think, did he, did he not? He, 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 Foreign he, Legion or something. He left the Foreign he Legion. He joined the French Foreign Legion. He joined, yeah. I mean, my, myself and Steve kind yeah. of converse as much as we can. And we, we have these kind of um, reunions up around Yorkshire and, and, and Manchester mm-hmm. and that, where I'd get like him or I'd guess um, Steve Anders, Kevin Jacks, yes, Steve Anders, yeah. um, you know, Aidan Walpole, Tony Linnells, myself. Tony, I like a load of A load of to turn up, you know, uh, uh, Paul Taylor, mm-hmm. Eddie Simpson. And we just have the crack in Colin Moore, Steve Green, uh, Steve Brooks. Yeah. And we've, we've had about, I think it's about six reunions now. And it's, it's a kind of just like keep an eye on each other if anybody's gone through a bit of a bad time. But it's also just to kind of, you know, go over the days and take the, the mick out of each other and take the piss out of each other and, and, and just slag each other off. And, you know, the last time I turned up for something, I had a, I had a yellow T-shirt done and they just started calling me the phantom flanflinger and I hadn't a clue what the phantom flanflinger was. And I was just, I just wanted to get rid of this custom bloody shirt. And I swear to God, they gave me the biggest abuse. But great crack, great crack. Good lads. Yeah, good, good lads, all tough lads. But say Tunstall, I do, I remember Tunstall bursting onto the scene. He must have gone five, four, five, six races where he just ran away from everyone. And then he suddenly seemed, I wouldn't say disappeared, but... I don't know. No, he, he, was, he, was a, he was around for a while. Um, you know, he, he joined the French Foreign Legion when he was 16. Um, I mean, I mean uh, the story he's told me and stuff like that. And he, he, he was his second day, he joined on his 16th birthday. Second day, he asked a question in English and he got a rifle butt to the side yeah. of the head. French. Mm-hmm. And he said, from French from now on. And he said, it's amazing, John, because, you know, he's a real Lancashire. All right, lads. 
Yeah. You know, and <laughs> that back in the week, John, I could speak French. It's amazing what fear can do to you, lad. So <laughs> it's good, lads. Great, lads. Great, lad. I, I, the, the, the amount of crack I had with Steve on trips was fucking fantastic. Yeah. A funny guy. But, you know, it's just... Are there any Kenyans coming? Yeah. Really? Really? That man. You know, I, I loved him. I, he was great. He was great. He was just he was just a simple Preston lad, but he could run. Jesus, he could run. Powerful. You know? Powerful. Yeah. Especially in the country. He just had this... That's what I remember. He style of country. country. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's what happened Dave Lewis. That's what happened Tim Hutchins and all these guys yeah. who taught, you know. And, I mean... When he ran for France at the World Cross Country in 1988, yeah. he, he came up to all the British team artists and he goes, you're out, lads. My mm. name's Steve Thompson. He says, oh, and they said, are you here visiting me? Are you watching the race? He says, no, I ran the race. <laughs> and, then, and they were like, you ran the race? Yeah, I, I run for France. I was, yeah. I was 13 today. <laughs> and they were all looking around. <laughs> they were all looking around. Like thinking Hackney, I think Hackney, I don't know if Hackney beat him or Hackney was behind him. I think, I think Steve was 13. I think he was, or it was one of the other. But they're all going like, oh, well, I was a second Brit home and the, or the first Brit home. And they were going, no, <laughs> running for France. Yeah. But he, 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 you know, he was, he was a great athlete, great athlete. It's, it, there's not enough known about him, actually. I mean, I, I have often thought his story should have been a little kind of a shock film, to be quite honest. It would be an awesome story, wouldn't it? Well, an amazing story. Like when you just mentioned the name, I said it was like the light switch came on. I remember thinking, yeah, I can still, I'm pretty sure it was a cross country race at Castle, uh, Cardiff Castle. And I remember him just leaving everyone. He ran yeah. away from everyone. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, what, what, that would be him. Yeah. Mm, what a story. Yeah, that would make. They used to get dropped in islands. And he'd say, he, he used to get dropped in an island out of a parachute, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he, he dropped on one side of the island and said, right, we're meeting you here in three weeks. If you're not here in three weeks, believe you. you've got to find your way back. Yeah. Well, that was it. They were given kind of coordinates and they had to survive in the jungle for three weeks. <laughs> like the jungle, the jungle of violence. Banana stuff. <laughs> yeah, they yeah, know. Huh? Yeah, no. yeah. Yeah. yeah no, amazing. Amazing. But, um, yeah. As I said, um, it's, it's great that you all still meet up. Yeah, so, so getting back getting back to your point, mate, getting back to your point, I, I, I never really made a plan going into the race because it was blown out of the water within a mile and a half, two miles, because you, you just, like the English National, I mean, seriously, nine miles, you, you could have 1,600 people. To, I mean, the biggest field I ever ran in it, I think, was nearly 2,500 one time, right? So you get out, and then when you get towards the front, you're starting to go, like, you're starting to go, Dave Lewis, Steve Tunstall, um, Eamon Martin. Uh, it just goes on. Uh, Craig Mockery, uh, Adrian Passy, Paul Taylor, Ian Hudspitz, Mark Hudspitz, you know, Glyn Tromans. It just... Oh, no, so no, no, it no, was no. pointless yeah. making a plan. You just... You, you just got in. And then when you got towards the business end and you were there, you did stuff, you know? Like my first English national I ran was Roundhead Park and I finished tenth. A fantastic performance. Mm -hmm. But I remember getting up eventually onto the back end of that group as it started to break away. And uh Dave, what you call it? When I got up, I started looking around who was there. There was Naraka, there was Taylor, there was Jeff Tumble, there was Paul Cuskin. I could go on all day, right? And some of the people would know these names and some won't. And I started walking up my PB for 5K in the race, and I was looking at theirs, and I was nearly 30. Nine seconds slower than the next slowest guy. Mm. That's the standard. That's what it was like. So it was pointless making a plan. Mm. And I beat guys that were better than me as well that day. But you know, it's it, it, it's it's about what you do on the day and how you adapt. And you'll make mistakes in a race like that. It's impossible not to because you have to learn your trade. Hundred mm. percent. So how, with the athletes that you're now coaching, how do you how do you structure and work their training programs and plans? Same as what very you much on feedback. Yeah, very much on feedback. Very much on flexibility. I mean, I try to get them right first. I, mean, I try if they if, if they need to be, you know, obviously proper shoes. But if they need orthotics, if they need them, if they need them, mm. and adapting to those if they get them. Because the biggest problem with somebody if they have a flaw and it needs to be corrected is having the patience to have a correct patience to have it corrected, and they don't give it time. Most people don't give stuff time. They want no, a magic want wand, want a, a magic bullet. They want it all yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When let your body adapt to something. So once that's that's good, for me, I probably I, I try to get the mileage up slowly. I don't worry too much about sessions. I get them in there. If it's a young kid, it'll be workouts and just keep it fun because you can't go there. 
they have to come to you to tell you, this is what I want to do. You can't be what you want. Never be what you want. So you're kind of a, a facilitator for a lot of juveniles, a lot of kids. Uh, a lot of them can be transient. A lot of them can stay. A lot of them, um, but they might only enjoy it. A lot of them leave. But you never know if they're going to come back. And you've hopefully left a good impression that you did things the right way. That if they do come back, you say, well, right, you're a bit older now. And you can speak to them a bit different. A lot of the problems today, um, Neil, is you, you can't talk to 15 and 16-year-olds the way you want to because they have rights now up to the age of nearly 19, the first day of 19. And by then, it's very hard to get a lot of the bad habits out that, that they've accumulated, not just in terms of running, but just in terms of their mannerisms and we know it all and attitude and stuff. You know, because sometimes you, you need to be uh, some tough love. And it's very hard to do that because your, your hands are behind your back now with that. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean, but I'm still very much, <clears throat> shall we say, the old school of it. Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's all about... Oh, that'd, be, that'd be me, but they, they have to buy yeah. into it because yeah. they come from... Like, I mean, I, I've it. got a guy here in Ireland now, and I think he's one of those. He's, he's an old school guy. But it's taken a while to find him, you know, because there's a lot of guys who say they want it, but then when they actually have to do it, and they're like, Absolutely. Like, I've got to do this every week. Mm. And I, I got to get out myself and I got to mentally do it myself. Different kettle of fish. You know, you got to find out if you're, if you're strong in here. Point is doing all, having a six pack in the starting line. If we can't see it, you finishing line because this is all week. So that's where I go with it. With you 100%. With you 100% on that. Yeah. Where does that come I mean, from? I mean, it's not, it's, go on. Where does that come from, that mental strength, John, do you think? Is that is that something you just learn in, in, in the training yourself or is that something that can be worked upon? Anything can be worked upon, Mark, I, I believe. I honestly believe anything can be worked upon. There's, it's, not, it's not an issue for me, but for me personally, I think, as I alluded earlier, I think to be work, see, ever since I was about three years of age, I've, I've worked. It was never forced to, you helped out your grandparents. It could be digging the potatoes in the garden. They would milk the cows by hand, so you'd milk the cows by hand. They'd crap, so you'd have to pike out the cow dung. You didn't have to go up and put, pike that onto a, a donkey and cart. You'd take it up the fields and you'd spread it out by hand. So everything you were doing was the use of yourself. You were out in all sorts of weather, doing whatever, putting up fins and horses, clearing out dikes, um, helping your dad, you know, like I'd be doing, lifting concrete blocks and cement blocks, bags of cement. Since it was that height, so, and, and then there would be days you'd be on jobs where it would be incredibly mind-numbingly fucking cold. Break your fingers, break your, your, your feet. You'd be using a hammer and chisel all day. Your hands would lock up. You'd have to break your fingers out one by one. So you were enduring all day. So when it came to running, enduring nine miles of pain wasn't an issue for me. No, I can't speak for anybody else. But... I, all I used to say to myself was, I've, I've felt pain before and I'm going to feel pain today. So pain is my friend. It's, it's not an enemy. I worked with it. I used it. But I wasn't stupid either. There were certain races I dropped out of. If I, I, when I knew there was, Jesus, there's something wrong with me here. Hang on. There's something seriously wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling the plug here. I, I can't explain what those things were, but I didn't just run. sometimes run just for the sake of this to get to the finish. I just felt there was something wrong. I bailed because the person that had to look after me was me. You know, point to somebody coming up to me and says, oh, you dropped out and what? You've left the team down. Excuse me, pal. I don't want to be in hospital and uh, serious issues. And then I'd see, you'll never see me again, like, you know, because you're not, I'm not able to run for you. Because that, that, that line of communication goes cold very quick when you get injured, you know, and you find out very quick who's, who's really in your corner. It's, just, it's your nearest and dearest, to be honest. Yeah. I'll just ask you, what, 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 what was the career highlight for you, John, then, in, in, in your running career? If you had to pick one, you, you mentioned you had, I'll get you on your other two regrets as well, if that's all right, because you mentioned you had three. Um, obviously, never going to the Olympics, you know. Um, and I should have gone to Australia. I had a chance to go to Australia, and I felt I wasn't educated enough. I didn't know what I was going to do if I went down there. Um, because it certainly wasn't going to be building sites. And, and I, 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 I'd come from this thing in school where, let's say I wasn't encouraged the best. Uh, I've been called stupid quite a lot. So uh, I, I didn't 
kind of that's that's the regret. But what was the first part of the question again? What was your career highlight, John? Uh, you, you, you must have one. So that's I'd have two. I'd have two. I'd have two. I'd have two. Uh, I, I I couldn't separate one from the other. I suppose my proudest moment in England was winning the British Cross Country Championships. You know, my mum, my dad was there that day. Everybody I know was there that day. So it was great, you know. Um, and PJ Fagan, my coach, was there and stuff like that. So that was a great day. That was, that was just, you know, to try and become a national champion in Ireland, great. But to become a, a, a British champion, that meant a lot. It, it kind of, all the hours you're out, the sacrifices, you know, the hours you'd be running in the freezing cold, wet, rain, wind, whatever. I thought, that's good. The, the other one was when I ran 13, 29 for 5K in, in Sweden. And, and, I, and I beat a kind of a good field there. Um, I thought, I'm actually, because I knew I could do it. And, and I'd set myself out for a year. I went to America in 93 and, and 94. And I'd kind of more or less become monastic. I'd be in bed at 8 o'clock in the evening. I was up at 7 in the morning, do my run. And if we do a small little bit of part-time work to get a few, bit of cash, I did that. Then I came back from that and we'd get back into bed for two or three hours. So I was recovering massively. And it was no fluke that I, I went to a different level. I knew I could. And it, 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 uh, it <coughs> copper fastened for me that... I was good at running, but the building sites were holding me back from my real potential. And um, I, I made a breakthrough uh, in, in that a major sponsor wanted to come in and look after me for five years and, and pay me really good money to become a full-time athlete. But um, <clears throat> somebody made a phone call to bury that, that deal. And um, I was back in the building sites within three weeks. So... That's 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 how the cookie crumbles, as I say. Oh, that's be so disappointing for that to happen, though. Crikey, how would you get over that? Like, what what could have been, maybe? I kind of, I kind, I, 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 do you know what? I don't think I ever have been honest. It's it's something that rankles, and and it's, you can't say it 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 it, it doesn't because it was particularly vindictive and nasty that what was done. Um. Um. I must admit, when I came back, um, it had kind of ripped the stomach out of me, to be honest with you, the heart out of me a bit. And I got injured, actually, shortly after that. I was jumping over a puddle at a, watching a friend of mine at a cross-country race, and I, I pulled my groin. And I didn't run that cross-country season. And I, and I think it would have been interesting because, again, I think the National and Luton and stuff like that was one I would have been going for and stuff like that, where Spencer Duval won and... My, myself and Spencer had some good battles, and I think I beat him more than he beat me. So, I, but in that, in saying that, on that year, that particular year, Spencer was absolutely flying. But it, I think you have to believe in yourself, not arrogantly. But if you don't believe in yourself and what you're bringing to the table, well, then you're on you're on the back foot from the word go. So I I could be cracking jokes with you about three seconds before the gun went, and I mean I'd be very relaxed, very relaxed. But the minute the minute that gun went, I, my game face was on. I could just change it. It was not, not an issue for me. I could do it, no problem. But um, that's, that's really stung, knowing that I should have been probably in America preparing the way I wanted to prepare. And I honestly and utterly believe in my heart of hearts that I could have ran about 13, 12. Um, it's easy to say that when you haven't done it, but I honestly and utterly believe I could have. Um, but look, you know, I mean, the guy that did it, I have no time and respect for at all. Um, just, just I, 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 I'd be gobsmacked sometimes when I think back on it as to what, what he did and stuff like that. But look, it's done. John, we, we, can't, we can't let you go, uh, uh, John, without having a chat about your, your, your famous vlogs on Facebook that, that have, uh, have come up in the last, is it last yeah. few years. And, and you hold some really, you're really passionate about, about obviously UK athletics and obviously what, what's been going on recently. Well, I'm, I, I'm kind of passionate about, well, it doesn't matter what country I'm in. I mean, like, I could go on about here. It's, 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 it's done here, especially. They've killed it here. They've absolutely killed it because we've got morons running the sport here. The reason I'm so passionate about over is obviously because I was indoctrinated and I, I know it inside and out. Um, they keep saying there's better people to run stuff over there and that. I'm, I'm yet to see it. Um, it's gotten worse and worse by the people governing it, whether it be England Athletics, whether it be UKA. And even in some of the areas, to be quite honest with you, Midlands and South and stuff like that. But I think that might be changing because people can see the writing on the wall. But 
I think England could be turned around. I think it could be made a massive, massive, proper region again, the way athletics was back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. I think it can be done. I, I, well, I, I know it can. I, I know it can. I believe it utterly in my heart and soul it can. And um, yeah, I come across a bit passionate because I suppose it's important to me. It's, it's, it's kind of running his divine, defined who I am. Um, it gave me a lot of opportunities. I've met a lot of friends and friendships out of it. I've, I've reacquainted with new people and uh, old people on Facebook that I knew and new people on Facebook that I didn't know. Um, <coughs> and I, I, just, I just would hate to see it go the way I, I believe 100% it's going to go, which is the high performance centers. Um, it's the only game in town for these guys because this is not about the sport. It's about control of lottery funding and lottery money to come to them, to pay them whether they succeed or they fail. And the club system will be completely gone. And that's a hard pill for me to swallow when I felt I could contribute and say something to try and make people aware this is what's coming and try and have it stopped. What, what would you do, John, if you were in charge? If you could, if someone said to you, right, John, you can, you, you, you're, the, you're the chief now, what would you do? First and foremost, um, Obviously, the, the fees which is coming from th those registered would would be ploughed back into athletics because it's not at the moment. It's going whatever your fifteen quid is. It's going to England and it's now going to go to UK. So basically, any money coming back for competition and development, and that's what we are about. We're a competition and development is our sport. We're trying to find young talent. We're trying to motivate us. We're trying to encourage it to stay and retain us. That's not happening. We have nine thousand seven hundred youngsters most years in under 17 and within a year we've lost 43 percent and within another year we've lost another 40 percent so we're losing 83 percent of that talent that's too much so we need to start looking at ways how we can stop that how can we incentivize coaches what can we give them how can we motivate them because they're not getting asked anything there's nothing being uh, asked to those people and I'll, and, I'll, and it's easy to explain that because if you look at this weekend, it'll be the England Athletic and it'll be the awards. Any person that becomes coach of the year in England Athletics, it's somebody that's employed by England Athletics. It's not somebody outside the system. So there's, there's no reward in people who are volunteering and volunteering. And without those volunteers, whether they be officials or coaches or the tea lady down at, you know, Ipswich Jaffa or whatever it is, you're lost. You have no sport. So for me, it would be empowering people again and giving them what they need. Um, I'd be bringing back inter areas. I'd be bringing, I'd be going after things like the London Marathon, and I would be absolutely squeezing them for what they owe the sport, and plowing that back into the running as well. Um, it, it, anything is about leadership, Mark. If you've got the right leadership, the right passion, and you get the right team around you, you can build something that's really, really good. Um, but you've got to stop looking after the people on the ground. Every time you go on a was a runner or you go on, even when I put on stuff, people are complaining because they're not being taught of, whether they be officials, because there's a certain core of officials who have status and get looked after. It's the same in the coaching fraternity. There's a lot of people inside in England and UK coaching that shouldn't be coaching because if you've got a 17-year-old athlete and they're are getting linked in they have nearly have to tell them what they're doing what they're training and then there's a mentor provided to interfere with what you're doing why would you do that so if you're signed up and you're paying your 15 quid to be england or you're paying your 60 quid in to be a member of whatever club you're then you're then asked to be a qualified coach and you have to pay for that i'd be doing courses but i would be making sure you wouldn't be paying the only courses i would be making sure you have to pay for are officials courses and stuff like that or and, and have that coming in, maybe, from revenue from the road races and the road, road race permits. There's a way of offsetting that, that you look after the very people that it's going to cost. So that's, that's all should go out. If people are volunteering their time, they should be remunerated in certain ways, or their cost should be brought down and limited. That's the sort of things I'd be doing. You, you, you want to win people over, do things to them that will win them over. Make them feel valued. Talk to them. Don't just be there like, I know Chris Jones of England Athletics has gone to different clubs around the country and I've had the people contact me, ask them a question. Sorry about that. Somebody came in with a call. Uh, somebody asked me a question because uh, I do this on my phone. Somebody asked me a question and um, basically 
I asked him a question and he turned around and said, it's a really good question. I'll get back to you with an email. Couldn't answer him the night. That puts people off. And that's why 11% of the clubs only voted at the AGM and 89% didn't because they get nowhere. They don't get an answer. There's apathy. you got to make people want to be in the sport. It's the only sport I know that everybody gets to compete, no matter what level you're at. When you go to soccer, and you've seen this, and I've seen this with my son and stuff like that, you're a sub, you're a sub, you're a sub in rugby, you're a sub in hockey, you're a sub in cricket, you're a sub in basketball. But in running, or throwing event, or hurdles event, or long jump, or high jump, or marathon, you get to compete. However, you, however your standard is there, is, there is a level for you to compete at. There's a cross-country race, there's a road race, there's whatever, track race, not, not in these other sports. And we're sold so badly, it's frightening. We're sold very badly. Nobody's going out shouting that from the rooftops. This is an inclusive sport. Your kid comes, he gets to compete. She gets to compete. You know, and every time you do something, you can see yourself improving. You know, you get your PR, or your PB. So you can actually see that you're improving yourself as you're going forward. And there's nobody that, that, that will disagree when they see themselves improving that it doesn't give them a nice feeling. Mm. Mm. How, about you, how about you, Neil? Is it a, a, a subject close to your heart as well? I know it's, uh, echo those views. 100%. The sport has changed so greatly. I mean, we're almost talking about two different sports now, aren't we? As well, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, athletic, there's athletics, which is, you know, your background, my background. And obviously I'm heavily involved through the business with a sport league where we are dealing with everyone, you know, and it tends to be now that everyone, you know, the masses of running, which is probably 80% of those that are out there running now are out there for running, for fitness, for health, for their own well-being, for their own own self-achievement, you know, um, you see it all the way on social media. And, and I've got no problem with it. I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome that anyone can go out and run as you, as you just said you know there are no substitutes but the, the sport has changed and, I, and i'm like you i'm with you all the way on this john i absolutely love athletics and i can see it is being affected down at grassroots levels right through the club system but and, and here's the but there's all these events springing up um you know there's let's be fair about it. i mean i speak to lots of people all the while you know right across the sport and I get amazed nowadays, and, and Mark knows this, about when I speak to some of the, even some of the runners in my group, John, they haven't got a clue who some of the, what I call legends and heroes are. I mean, I absolutely hear a worship people. I think you're a legend, mate, without embarrassing you. You know, but you talk to people and they don't know who they are. They don't even know that he like that, didn't you? They don't even know, you know, they don't even know who won the races anymore that they were in. It's all about, and I get it, and I'm, I'm made up for them. It's about, you know, them just competing, doing it in their own way and getting their own medal. But it's not just the clubs organising the, the big events now, is it? You know, there's all these event companies out there organising all these brand new events. And I don't know where all the money's going, mate, when it come in, come in from these Well, it, it's, not, it's not coming back into running. And that's yeah. one of the biggest things I go after. because it, And, 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 and it's, it's, something has to be done. It's there. The money's there, but it's going to the wrong people. And if they're not fighting for you, well, then they're not helping you. Mm. I'd be fighting for you. That, but that's, that's who I am. I mean, because I, I think... When I look at all the different aspects and, and the different strands of the sport that I knew over and that it could all be gone, it's actually very hard to um, process, to be quite honest. But running's a boom industry, and that's the thing, is because running is booming, now, and this is what bothers me as well, it always seems that there's always someone out there who's ready to jump on the bandwagon. And if running dried up, at some point this year, you know, there'd be a lot of these same people would just disappear off to the next thing. This uh, becomes the next boom industry. Yeah, but this is this is where that if there's a New England or something form, which I think there has to be. That's my personal opinion. I mean, I've been drumming it out for ages and stuff like that. With the right people on board, you have to make people go, Jesus, I want to be involved in that. I like what that guy says. I like the way he talks. You know, I'm not PC. I'm not PC. I'm, I'm you know, a deranged badger half the time and stuff like that. But I don't mind that. You know, I want to be different. I want to bring people into the sport. I want people to come along and go, that's fun. That's enjoyable. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's a Laura Muir or it's a new kid starting off or it's, it's, it's a Rob Denmark or whatever, whatever standard, John Brown. It's about being able to engage and talk to those people, but making it, making it most accessible for the people that's going to provide us. Not just the competition providers. What I mean by that is the clubs and coaches that there's an incentive, that they're being listened to. Now, I'm not going to listen to Waffle, 
people are going to go off it. He said that, and then uh, uh, not going to listen to that crap. But if it's a genuine problem, we can improve on it, and we can get more people to the sport and retain it and have different strands going out of it. For, and what I mean by that is people running for England. When you look at back at Gateshead, you had maybe about 20 people running for England. You had England A, England, England, yeah. England, England A, England B. So what they were doing is they were given opportunities, incentivizing this, you know. They were picked to go to Ninov, Percy in France, uh, Costa Figaro, you know, it could go on. Um, uh, what's that one in, 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 in uh, Italy? Amoruso, Dincinca Melina. I could go on all day. Cross country races in, in Germany. There's none now. There's no race in Germany. I have people, Neil, ringing and getting in touch with me from France and from Italy saying 90% of our races are gone. What do you suggest we do? And I said, what's your federation like? And then they go, oh, same problem. We have failed careerists, failed politicians getting into these positions and they don't care about the sport. Joanne Coates is inside the UK Athletics because me, Matt Yates and Martin Slevin stopped Zara I. Peters getting that position. We've got rid of CEOs. We've got rid of Bowker. We went through the UK Members Council. We went through uh, the, re the nine regional councils, the national council to object and put in why they were failing what they were doing, why they weren't up to standards, what decisions they'd made, and then they got voted out. And we did that. And that's, you need to do that. But it's what's going to come in and replace it. And it needs to be people with young blood, young ideas, a passion for us. Um, I'll be straight up. I'd love to be one of those people. Think it could contribute a lot. Not, there's other people there as well, but I definitely would want to be involved. And I have no embarrassment to say in that, because if you don't believe in yourself, who will? And what do you think the likelihood of that is becoming, you know, a reality? Don't know. Don't know. I mean, it's not in my hands. It's not in my hands. I mean, I mean I'm with you. you know, if you look at the age profile and most, most of the people, if you look at the, the age profile of most of these people, you're talking from probably 66 up to 78 years of age. And if they're going to form something new, what's the young blood going to be like? I mean, we're in a crisis with officials, which was of September 2019, the crisis was, not just 2020. And I know a lot of officials who've now decided they don't want to come back, especially with that thing that came out yesterday with diversity and uh, LGBT. They, they just felt that they weren't accommodating anybody. They felt maligned, besmirched. And, and I'm not just making this up. People genuinely go, well, I've helped and I've given and I've done everything that I can to try and make young people feel good. And yet what came out yesterday was like they were not fit for purpose and being involved in this sport. I think it's systematic. I think it's de deliberate coming from central government to try and break it down and get rid of it. Um, and I would just try and keep exposing it and try and save it as best as, best as I can. Whether something new is formed and I get in there. Another call. Cool. And I get in there. Another call, yeah. It's the first, worst thing about being on the phone. Whether I get in there or whatever is another thing. So that's down to all the people to say, you know what, he should be on board. I don't know if they will or not. I'd, I'd like to be because... I understand it inside out. I know who to ring. I know how to motivate people. I know who to call. I know what teams I'd bring in. And it would be bloody fun. All of a sudden, television crews would come back because I'd make it fun. I would. I'd make it fun. I'd, I'd make it. When you interview me, it's going to be fun. And then you switch around when you get when you get a certain audience there. Right now, I'm over the limelight. I'm in the back. It's about him. It's about her. But you've got to get characters again, Neil. We need characters. We need people that come on the television screens, make people laugh make people smile, come out with great one-liners and whisk. Yeah, yeah, we need that, yeah. big time. Absolutely, I'm with that 100 yeah. Well, you, you, do, you do that, you're on a winner. You get people yeah. in, they'll do it, you know? Yeah. All right, is that it? Am I, uh, am I free to get out of jail? Uh, mate, I, 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 just before you go, you got to hear five random questions, John, all right? Just before you go, mate, all right? So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> right, this first one, mate. This will be fun. You've just run a marathon. What's the first thing you eat and the first thing you drink? First thing I eat? Tiramisu. Tiramisu. That'd be the first thing I eat. Tiramisu. <laughs> tiramisu. And, um, <laughs> uh, and, and to drink. Oh, gosh. Pine of Guinness. Pine of Guinness. Yeah. Right. Tiramisu and a pint of Guinness. That's, that's some combination. What a combination that is. That's a headline, Mark. That's a headline. Yeah. 
<laughs> right, you can listen to one song to get you in the zone before a race. What do you listen to? I never had it at the time, but if I had, it would have been Eminem, Eight Mile. Oh, good. Yeah, that's a cracking tune. Now, yeah, good choice. Good choice. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, I, um, I didn't have it, but my my go-to song when I started out was Saxon and Never Surrender. Oh yeah, you'll nice. have to look that up. Yeah, no. I, Do you remember them, Neil? I see him playing Norwich, mate. Yeah. Never Surrender by Saxon. Yeah, and I tried to have that as my mantra, you know. Yeah, Chris, I remember playing in Norwich years ago. Yeah. What what are your favourite trainers to wear, John? With me, uh, it was always Asics. I loved Asics. Asics are the, are, are the baby I like. That's my baby, Asics. I always liked them. Um, never liked Nike. I always found Nike very narrow and very hard. Asics. I've tried a few others and stuff like that, but for me, it was always Asics. Good stuff, good stuff. Right, you've hit the wall and you're completely depleted. You're just about to quit. You can see one person on the side of the road to, or the track to get you through this hard spell. Who do you see and why? My daughter. Lovely. Thought that might be the Ellie, Ellie's Down syndrome. And I think if I saw her, I'd have to get through it. She yeah. she would motivate me to get through it. That would be, that'd be it. No disrespect to anybody else, my, my families, our friends and that. But my daughter, absolutely, 100%. I don't think anyone can argue with that. And this is the one we've all been waiting for. And I think you've had a bit of uh, a bit of notice on this one. What is your favourite cheese? Oh, Wensleydale with cranberries. <laughs> <laughs> don't you know? He said to me last week, Wensleydale with those bits in it. Those bits. What you I couldn't thinking? think of the word cranberry. I couldn't think of the word cranberries. <laughs> I was going round in my head going, what the fuck are them things called again? I couldn't think of it. I couldn't think of it. Uh, and yeah. It's by, the way, by the way, mate, I've been counting. Listen, Mark. Seven, 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 seven Fs, mate. You've been what? <laughs> seven Fs. That's a record oh, too, oh, isn't it? Or eight. Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. 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 One, one for each day of the week. I haven't done any, have you? One for each day of the week. Right. Yeah. Right, Neil, we're going to move on to training tip of the week now. And there's, there's <laughs> unfortunately, that, that we discussed this before the podcast, there's, there's only really one training tip at the moment, isn't there? But uh, you've obviously got, got something more to say about that. No, I mean, all I've got to say about that, Mark, is, is I mean, how, how do you structure training programs at the moment? You know, when, you, when you've got people of all sort of diverse abilities that come to me, certainly, and, and, and lots of other coaches, you know, asking for help in that. Now, as I said, as I mentioned in my column last week, I think it's important to get inside your athlete's mind, certainly know your athlete. Um, what I mean by that is not just what they're capable of as a runner, but as a person, what's going on in their lifestyle at this moment in time, you know. <laughs> For some of us, it's all becoming too, what's the word, too too consuming, you know, everything out there, you know, it's almost like we're in a bit of a time warp. Now, let's take yourself, for instance, I mean, God almighty, mate, I'm, I know I know how much work you've got on your hands at the minute, you're, you're doing as much work as possible from home for the EDP, you've got your children at home, so you're doing homeschooling, and of course, you are you, you are a very driven athlete, whether you, you, you like me saying that or not, you are, you're a driven person, Yeah, and uh, with that in mind, mate, you always want to be the best you can be, but if that's going to bring extra pressure, then mate, it, it, it's just a, it's, it's going to end it's going to end up bad, so to speak. You know the script, mate. In the end, you're just going to blow a gasket and you're going over the top. So for me, when I when I see athletes like you, and you're not the only one, it's a question of just sit down, let's just chill out a bit, and let's just go out and enjoy running. Let's keep running, enjoy a bit. Let's not add any pressure. And, Yes, we can still do the session during the week. Yes, we'll still go out and do a nice long run on a Sunday if it fits in with the kids and everything else. But just take the pressure off and keep running because the most important thing about fitness anyway is consistency. I completely that in that I think in the last 10 days or so, I've, I've just I've not thought about sessions at all. I've, I've just tried to get out when, when I can in the little pockets or little windows of time that I can. I've still managed to get out sort of three, four, five times a week, but I, I've not thought about sessions. I've just kept it easy. And, and it, it's funny enough, it was only yesterday I started chatting to you yesterday about introducing a, a, a session and maybe a bit of tempo. But 
but I only sort of feel ready to do that now after getting my head around what the current situation is. And, and I'm still not going to put any pressure on it. If I can do it, great. If not, then... And there'll be that time, and you're right, man. you'll just go out one day and it'll be like a breath of fresh air because the pressure's taken off and you feel great. And you're running along thinking you're just going to have a nice, relaxed, comfortable run, and guess what? You feel brilliant. And you start sticking in, you know, you're up the tempo, you start sticking in a few bursts, or you start sticking in, you know, a few reps and, and efforts and that. Brilliant, that's how you do it, no pressure. And then you come back and go, wow, that was awesome. But where is this in front of, oh, God, i got to go out. He wants me to do six times a mile with two minutes recovery. He wants the first two at this pace to third and fourth at that pace, and then I've got to really give it some for the lap fifth, you know, you get it. And then on the other hand, you've got other athletes, such as, you know, Callum Bowen-Jones and, and another kid I've got called Dave Pobble over in Wales. Mate, they need it. They need the pressure. They need me to lump the pressure because I suppose that also takes their mind off what's going on outside there at this moment in time, you know, and obviously they don't have the same constraints with children as you do. But so with them, yeah, I am putting the pressure on them. That Yeah, they are still trying that. And, and you know, not only with in mind that we are, I'm sure, going to be racing this year. There are going to be races. So keeping that in mind that, boy, you, you know, those guys that you want to race against, they're, they're going to be working hard. So you keep working hard. You also got your target times to hit. So let's do it. And I've been giving them time trials. I mean, I gave them two of them time trials last week um, where I made sure they went into it completely focused as though they were doing a race. The, the pressure was coming from me. And... Dave, who's been making a, a big comeback, he's a super, super athlete as a junior, but and then he got into professional cycling and he's now making a concerted comeback just for himself. He's, I don't think he really want to commit. I just want to see what he can do now he's in the sport. And he did 35 minute 10K. He's not happy with that. Great. That's what I want because we know we can go back. And Callum did a 5105 10 miler. But once again, he started out very conservative with a 515 mile. And we said, let's stay with that 512s, 515s, and see what we have left at the end. And he ended up with a 444, 444 last mile. Full of running, 51 and 5. There you go. There you go. So, the best thing about that is good performances, but both have come away knowing that there's still more to come and it was still there in the tank that they needed on the day. So, they're highly motivated, mate. And that's good. So, as I said, mate, training tips at the moment is understand your athletes, you know, if you're a coach. And if you if you haven't got a coach, well, understand yourself and be honest with yourself. And uh, if you thrive on the pressure, keep going. Keep in mind that you will be racing at some point this year. And uh, if not, just go out and enjoy your running. So, Neil, Featherby's funnies this week. You're taking us back to the Wissy Half Marathon in 1988, and uh, it was full of hijinks, to say the least, wasn't it? It was full of everything, mate. I don't know what I don't know exactly what you'd call it, but it was it was, uh, it was surreal. Let's call it surreal. But it was looking back on it, mate. It was fun. I didn't find it quite so funny at the time, if I'm honest with you. Um, but yeah, no, um, it was on the day of the race. I remember it was on the radio. There'd been a, there'd been an armed gun siege over at, at Stokeberry, down in Market Way, wherever it was. And uh, I'd already entered the race with uh, um, Ronnie White, and me and Ronnie were travelling out. And then I took a phone call. I thought it was from Peter, but it wasn't apparently. I wrote about it in, uh, in one of my Facebook blogs this week. But I know who it was. You know, it's got from a guy called Matthew, who actually he was going into business for me and Pete at the time, but he was going to drive the lead car and he basically told me what had happened. The course has been changed. Oh, bloody hell. My first thought was, right, okay, how far is the course? Is it over distance, under distance? What was my OCD and all that stuff? Anyway, when we got there, they sort of, we all stood on the start line, they read the instructions. I won't really listen. I just wanted to get going and think I'll follow the lead car, and uh, which I did. And to be fair, I, I got away fairly quickly into the lead and uh, following the lead car. And it was around about eight miles down this country lane with this sort of lay by bit. The lead car pulled over and Matt shouted out, I'm stopping here now, now Neil, to eat my sandwich. <laughs> to which I went, you what? And I went, which way? Which way? And he went, just keep going straight ahead. You'll see the signs. Follow the signs. At that point, I'm thinking, I know I ain't going to see no signs. You know, you could just see these long country lines. Ahead. Anyway, I came to a junction and uh, was, do I go right or do I go left? Do I go straight over? And there was definitely was no signs saying anything about the race, right? So at that point, I'm also thinking, have I already gone wrong? Because we're at a junction, there should be a race on something. I might have already gone wrong. And it was silent, mate. There weren't no cars on the road. There's nothing. But the sign did say to the left, Stoke Ferry, and I can't remember what it said, two miles or whatever, but I think, well, it's Stoke Ferry, the race is in Stoke Ferry, let's go that way. And as I'm bombing down this long straight road, 
I'm thinking, am I going right? Am I going wrong? And with I just pick the pace up. It's almost like panic, you know. I'm picking the pace up, and the next thing I know, you can see Stuke Ferry ahead. And this it was a, it was a different finish this year to what it had been when I'd done it the previous year or previous time in '86. And I could see crowds. I thought, oh well, that's right. And then I looked at my watch, and Auntie Matt said 58 minutes, and I'm thinking, oh my word, no one's even broken the hour for a half marathon at this stage, and I'm about to set a world record. I've got to slow down. This is embarrassing. I'm going to have to slow. And I really did. I, I really slowed down and jogged in. And I still came in in 60 minutes and 21 seconds. And in my head, I'm going, don't explode. Don't explode. Don't don't say nothing. Don't get angry. And then people start patting me on the back. Well done. Well done. What an awesome time. Fantastic. Well, I wouldn't say I exploded, but I did. I did lose my temper a little bit. It's fun. Don't be bloody stupid. I can't run that fast. And then, here comes the best bit. The next thing you know, two minutes, well, several minutes later, runners started appearing from a different direction. And then runners started appearing from the same direction I'd come. And then more runners started appearing from another direction. And it just became the point, it's funny, but they'd done the presentation, mate, and I, and I got in the car. And when I looked, well, I was just armed full of trophies. And when I got in the car with Roddy on the way back, one of the trophies said, was he said, first male. Another one said, first male vet well i was 30 at the time and the other one said first lady <laughs> which just summed it which just summed it all up. i ain't got a clue what happened mate but then ronnie started telling me about when they came to that junction they took a right turn he said he was running uphill and suddenly this wheelchair come bombing down the hill with the guy swearing his head off with loads of other runners around him so ronnie took halfway up he and ran and went to the bottom of the hill with him. Then someone else said, no, you have got to go back up the hill. And he said, the guy in the wheelchair was going absolutely mental, pushing himself up the hill and runners running oh, back up the hill. No. But, you know, to be fair to him, there was an armed siege. And as I said, they had to change the course on the day. And uh, I don't know what they've done, mate, when they come and change in the course and that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's just, um, you got to feel, you had to feel sorry for the organisers. And, uh it certainly made for something to look back on, didn't it, all these years later and at least have a laugh about. That's it. And that's the most important thing at the moment. Thanks very much. For Absolutely, listening. mate. Yeah, 100%. Keep smiling, keep laughing. That's it. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm.